The U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations advanced the Taiwan Travel Act last Wednesday after the House passed the bill on January the 10th. What will be the impacts of this act on China-U.S. bilateral relations? Taiwan refused permission for nearly 200 flights by Chinese airlines over the street, claiming that it hasn't been consulted about the route. Is that denial due to an issue regarding aviation, or is it politically motivated? Rescuers ended their search on Sunday after a building partially toppled by a 6.4 magnitude earthquake that hit Taiwan last Tuesday, leaving the final death toll at 17. Why was the rescue team from the Chinese mainland prevented from helping? Taiwan has endured a low poll rating since taking office and with the local election coming this year, will she maintain her foreign policies? How will the political map shift in Taiwan two years ahead of the next general election? Well, festive atmosphere across the Taiwan street gets frosty with Taiwan's denial for the application of extra flights across the streets. Taiwan authorities cited a lack of consultation over the flight routes as a reason for their veto of direct flights between Taiwan and the mainland for the spring festival. These flight routes have been practiced for a number of years during the KMT leadership. Does the green Taiwan still accept the Chinese Union New Year? Is Taiwan's decision connected to the U.S. House of Representatives passing of the Taiwan Travel Act? And will the Defense Authorization Act legally label China as a strategic competitor by the U.S. along with Russia? To take a closer look at the strained cross-street relationship, we are pleased to be joined by Yang Xiyu, who is a senior fellow at the China Institute of International Studies, and Gregory Inglian a Taiwan Affairs commentator. We shall also speak to Joanna Lei Chen, a former Taiwan legislator, on telephone. Joining us by Skype will be Richard Weitz, the director of the Center for Political Military Analysis at the Hardison uh, Institute. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Now, the Taiwan Travel Act. What do you think of the impact? I think the impact is uh, symbolic, not sub substantial, because uh, uh, with the act in place, it doesn't necessarily mean that from now on, uh, the visits across the uh, Pacific Ocean between the United States and Taiwan would be frequent, and also the high-ranking officials will come uh, in and out freely. I see this basically as a gesture of support and uh, friendship from the congressman in the United States, uh, giving Taiwan a, some kind of a consultation, some kind of a, uh, a pat on, on the back. But I do not see the necessity or the possibility of having this thing done to the bottom, to have real substantial visits uh, between the uh, United States and Taiwan, particularly in the higher level. I see that's what I think. It, it, that's really see, is. what are your thoughts on the uh, act? Well, Can uh, it be compared with the Taiwan Relations Act, which is yet another domestic law that threatens to interfere with the internal affairs across the Taiwan Street? Uh, well, uh, uh, it depends. Uh, uh, firstly, I do think uh, this uh, travel act is a really fundamental uh, event in the China-U.S. relation, simply because this act could probably intervene the domestic uh, internal affairs, especially the affairs across the street. And, uh, but that's not necessary because uh, act is one thing and the action is another. The, the caution and the concerns for Beijing, for me, for every Chinese people is that act actually opened a door for a dangerous actions. So today you have act. Tomorrow, nothing happened. But you cannot guarantee nothing happened forever. So when the act is set here, and uh, whenever the so-called situation or opportunity comes, there could be some provocative uh, actions or actions violating uh, one China principles. So that is the significance of the act. The One China Principle does lay a groundwork or cornerstone for the U.S.-China relationship. Let me cross over to Joanna Lei and Richard White. Uh, they are standing by in Taipei and the D.C. I wonder if they agree with uh, Xi Yu and share his concerns on the One China Principle. But Joanna, um, how serious is the Taiwan Travel Act? 
Well, certainly from the Taiwan perspective, Taiwan has been very marginalized in the global geopolitical scene, partly because Taiwan officers were not able to, high-ranking officers were not able to travel to the United States and vice versa. So from a purely Taiwan perspective, any lifting of such restrictions will be welcomed, not only by the current DPP administration, but by the people in general. However, we also understand that U.S. has a very specific um, strategy in terms of how to deal with cross-strait relations in the current regime. And the current strategy seems to be quite different from previous administrations. While they do show a lot of friendly gestures to Taiwan, it can also put cross-strait relations in jeopardy. So it is a glass half full and a glass half empty. Richard. What do you think of the situational unpredictability uh, brought about by the Taiwan Travel Act? Because uh, a Chinese guest speaker here in the Beijing studio says, well, this is a very, very dangerous. Uh, no one knows for sure whether um, tangible actions will be taken and more measures will be rolled out by the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House to antagonize the mainland, which stands for the One China Principle and the 1992 Consensus. I'd like to have your thoughts on the impact. Sure. I tend to agree mostly with your first speaker who sees this act as symbolic. The uh, administration, uh, after a few weeks in office, made, uh, when it was a bit confused on the issue, it was made clear it adheres to the One China Consensus uh, and recognizes the, the People's Republic of China as the, the one China. Um, so this, what I think what you're seeing is actually Congress a bit frustrated that the presidency of uh, the Trump administration has not moved uh, as fastly as might have been expected by President Trump's rhetoric to support Taiwanese autonomy. He I think correctly has been trying to focus on working with Beijing on Korea and other issues. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, uh, Gregory and Xi, in recent weeks, the mainland saw the release of a string of official documents from Washington about uh, taking China as a strategic competitor. If you look at the um, 2018 uh, National Defense Authorization Act and the National Security a paper about the China and the Russia, you got a strong feeling that it's yet another Cold War. Well, you cannot uh, use the exact uh, message or implications of what happened before 1991 to uh, illustrate the current geopolitical rivalry between Washington and Beijing. However, it seems that both Republicans and Democrats agreed to build a consensus in reassessing the impact of China's rise, saying, look, China will be the only country to challenge the primacy of the U.S. It is against this broad backdrop that so many official documents have been released to really take China as a, a, a rival in what is called a Thucydides trap. Well, I would say uh, release of uh, paper uh, uh, claims whatsoever is a secondary. Uh, look at these two superpowers, United States and China. Uh, yes, uh, between two major countries, there are always conflicts and also cooperation. Under the circumstances, it's the best for both countries to work on the area that benefit themselves plus the world as at, at large. So with that in mind, I don't think uh, this relationship will go to, go to go to get even worse. I think, uh, consider everything that happened so far, uh, China is in a good position to continue to grow. And I would, say, would not say the United States target China as a country to be contained or to be uh, uh, fine. Look, we don't against. have the luxury of discussing the broad bilateral mm -hmm. relationship between these two most important countries uh, and most country consequential bilateral relationship in the 21st century. Let's focus on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the issue of Taiwan will put the two countries uh, into a collision course? Yes, uh, the, the possibility or probability remains there, or always there. So uh, many Chinese believe there's no any reason for U.S.-China falling in a war, but Taiwan issue. China and the U.S. can negotiate on everything but Taiwan issue. So if U.S. determined to intervene in Taiwan, 
then China will have no any other choice. What will be the manifestations of the U.S. interference? Well, uh, I think uh, through the past few decades uh, engagement between Beijing and Washington, D.C., uh, both of the parties in Washington have uh, been familiar with the uh, significance of Taiwan issue. So they, uh, fortunately, every administration of Washington, D.C. has been um, cautious, rel uh, most of the period, relatively responsible. However, with the, you mentioned the paper, and uh, they have set uh, China as one of the rival powers. That's really significant. And uh, when Excuse you... Excuse me, what's your definition about the rival or rivalry? Does it mean enemy? Does it mean hostile force? Uh, yes, I, just now I, I noticed you, you used the um, uh, term, say, uh, competitor. I think a competitor is uh, something mutual. Competition is good, and uh, but rivalry is another thing. So basically, rivalry contains more negative meaning than competition. So when you as said you uh, uh, China and Russia as a rival power, that means at least uh, in potential, that was uh, that is enemy. So the competition uh, between the two is uh, the nature of the competition is. Uh, zero-sum game. All right, let me cross over to Joanna. Do you think uh, this is a zero-sum game over the issue of Taiwan and the cross street relationship is likely to generate more rivalry between these two major powers, the United States and China? Well, certainly the United States has taken different strategies and different grand strategies toward mainland China. At one point it was confrontational and at another point they built linkages in order to provide leverage to the um, U.S.-China relations. So in our view, it is critically important for both the United States and China to be able to recognize the power of each other. I think it's blatantly clear that mainland China is no longer the singular superpower in the world. There are other rising powers in the world, whether they will be treated as rival or competitors, takes a very deep and heartfelt soul search to Excuse find out what's the best Excuse me, Joanna, let me double confirm. Country. Joanna, let me double confirm. So long as you are concerned, have policymakers and lawmakers in the D.C. used such words like rival or rivalry to characterize the relationship between Washington and Beijing? Well, certainly they have always very, been very careful in choosing the right words. And every word carries strong meaning and carries very strong uh, policy implications. I think with the choice of rival or rivalry and the sub ensuing increase in both the military authorization, increasing the military build-out in the Asia-Pacific, U.S. has taken a very strong long-term strategy towards its... In other words, uh, in Joanna, you are not sure whether the word of a rival has been collectively has been carefully used. Uh, let me cross over to Richard. Richard, you've been working uh, for a think tank and uh, dealing with uh, many similar think tanks in the D.C. Let me know whether you can say for sure that words like rival and rivalry have become a common practice in generating their policy papers about China. Well, it's, it, that's a, a commonly a common framework among the national security commu community. It's not so much rivalry; it's described more as great power competition. And the idea is, whereas the previous administrations tended to focus more on interdependence or um, other issues, the Trump administration wants to focus more on managing the, uh, the competition, as they describe it, with Russia and China for uh, economic, political, and military influence. Uh, the focus, though, has been more on Russia as the more assertive power, even though people presume that China will be the more powerful uh, competitor over the long term. For now, Chinese policy has been fairly moderate, 
whereas Russian policy has been more assertive. And so, but but China and Russia are often treated as the same kind of of uh, challenge for planning purposes. You know, a great a, a great very powerful country equivalent to the United States in many ways. Um, gentlemen and Joanna, let's look at the worst case scenario concerning the Taiwan Travel Act. Now, Mr. Li Keqing, Minister of Consular at the Chinese Embassy in the U.S., voiced the concern after the latest Defense Authorization Act was signed that the U.S. Navy's actions could directly lead to war, meaning any deployment of the warships at Kaohsiung or a nearby port in Taiwan would amount to declaration of war for the PLA armed forces. Do you think this is a very serious, devastating issue for the bilateral relationship? Let me uh, give the floor to Xi Yu. Well, the, uh, we're concerned about the probability, and the probability is always the fluctuations. Uh, basically saying, when U.S.-China relation is in good shape, the probability uh, of what you mentioned would be pretty low. Whenever the so-called rivalry or competition is increasing, then the option of sending warships to Taiwan will be one of the options on the White House uh, as a leverage or tool against China. So basically, that is why I said the Travel Act really opened a dangerous door. Not necessarily happen. It's not a Pandora box. Let me cross over to Joanna. You wisely said that the Washington has been leveraging the Taiwan Relations Act or whatever you call it, even the latest uh, move of uh, passing the Taiwan Travel Act uh, in the hope of uh, you know, uh, building a kind of a hedge or whatever it means. Uh, having said this, uh, we know Tsai Ing-wen, leader of Taiwan, has been able to use lobby groups in the D.C. to influence policymakers and, of course, lawmakers as well, so that this Taiwan Travel Act could be easily approved by lawmakers. Now, having said this, do you think she's playing fire? Now, Li Keqing, our senior diplomat in the D.C., suggested any move of deploying the warships could amount to gunboat gun policy, and that's very provocative. The mainland would have a zero tolerance for this because that endangers the one China principle. What do you think of the consequences? China? Well, I think um, this travel act does not open directly to worship coming to the port of Jilong or Kaohsiung. However, it does open to U.S. Uh, military personnel, military experts, strategists to come to Taiwan and aid in the local military drill. And those are very likely scenarios which are opened by this Taiwan Travel Act. So I think before we see uh, physical uh, warships coming to our ports, we may see increased military exchanges. And that may also be a very sensitive um, possibility for mainland China to react to. So what we are lo looking at in Taiwan, and especially people worried about the cross-strait relations, are concerned about future military drills participated by the high-level U.S. Um, officials, especially military officers, and that could also be something very provocative to mainland China. And with it, that will be to the best benefit of Taiwan and to the best interests of people on Taiwan will be a very questionable thing for people to look at. Uh, let's look at the six assurances by the U.S. Congress concerning Taiwan. Number one is the United States would not set a date for arms sales to Taiwan. The United States would not consult the mainland before engineering any arms sales to Taiwan. And the United States would never ever formally recognize uh, the sovereignty of China over the island. Now these assurances sound pretty provocative for the mainland. Let's look at arms sales to Taiwan. Do you think uh, as a result of the Taiwan Travel Act and uh, other policy papers from the D.C., um, arms sales will increase substantially and in style as well? Yes, I think, uh, I think uh, among the six points, uh, two points are most dangerous and serious. One is the arms sale to Taiwan. Uh, uh, in fact, U.S. has committed to Beijing uh, back in uh, eight, 1987, 
say from 1987 when the joint communique signed, U.S. will gradually reduce the uh, amount and the qu both quantity and the quality of arms sale to Taiwan. You are talking about August 17th document. Oh yes, and now they do the opposite. They have they have broken their commitment. That is a very serious uh, uh, bad de uh, development. And I think the more uh, more serious development is U.S. through the act uh, through the, uh, the, the the insurance say they will never recognize. China's sovereignty on this island. That is violates China's sovereignty, but also violates US, uh, the agreement the U.S. have uh, signed with China. So uh, I think uh, the two points will make the bilateral relation between China and the U.S. in a really, really worse shape will cause countless turbulences. Let's look at the driving force behind the passing of the Taiwan Travel Act uh, region. <coughs> Now, it seems the Trump administration feels increasingly upset about uh, our exports uh, to the United States because uh, we have generated a lot more trade surplus uh, over the course of uh, 2017. Uh, look, we have a huge forex reserve of up to you know three trillion. Uh, the United States, uh, uh, you know, has had so much uh, trade deficit. Also, on the issue of DPRK denuclearization, it seems. Uh, China has not completely lived up to the expectations of the Trump administration. Now, do you think these factors have contributed to the very top position of the lawmakers and the policymakers to pass such a Taiwan Travel Act? What do you think of our considerations about this backdrop? Well, that is true. I think that the Trump uh, administration people are right. I ha they are. They would wish that China would solve the Korea problem for them some way with sanctions or replace Kim Jong Un if possible or something. And the trade issue is a, 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 a reoccurring a background problem. Although President Trump has emphasized that less than I thought, given his campaign rhetoric. But in a way, the Congress is reacting to their own set uh, disappointed expectations. They thought, at least Taiwan's backers thought from Trump's statements uh, that he would move much more boldly on Taiwan than he actually has. And I see Congress trying to press him to do so. Um, and so in a way it's Congress that's, that's driving the issue uh, through this legislation and so on. Whereas, for, for example, the bureaucracy, I know the State Department doesn't want to do anything to damage the relationship with China. And the Pentagon considers China, uh, the Taiwan issue of much less importance in the past. So much so that, as you know, the first <coughs> edition of the Nuclear Posture Review actually showed Taiwan as part of China in the map. And they had to, somebody noticed that and recalled it, but it shows that for many people in the military, the Taiwan issue is not as important as it was, say, 10, 15 years ago. Given the growing situational unpredictability across the Taiwan Strait and the mounting tensions between Washington and Beijing over such issues, what do you think of, uh, um, for example, Xi Yu, um, um, the, the two militaries are likely to have uh, clashes in the South China Sea, near the Diaoyu Islands, and the, over the uh, issue of uh, joint military drills uh, near the Korean Peninsula. I mean, uh, we're going to show more signs of such defiance and uh, unwillingness to cooperate, and uh, that will be very dangerous. Well, uh, I firmly believe, firmly, there won't be any kind of uh, military uh, clashes between U.S. and China, navies, air force, in South China Sea, uh, Diaoyu Island, and the uh, Korean Peninsula in foreseeable future, simply because both U.S. and China share the common interests in these areas. Uh, take uh, South China Sea as an example. They insist on the so-called freedom passages. And it is China, we have a more, uh, it is China that has... Freedom of navigation, freedom of navigation and freedom yeah, of overflight. But, but, you know, uh, freedom, we have different definitions between uh, freedom of uh, passages. Uh, but basically, peace and stability on the South China Sea is the common ground for China and the U.S. However, on Taiwan issue, no any 
room for compromises. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are in the zero-sum game. Uh, if we want to avoid such uh, conflicts, we, we need to move, change the game into the win-win game, say, based on the one China principle, then Taiwan mainland and U.S. can get a win-win result. Well, uh, worms of the cow are likely to be unleashed due to the uh, mistrust between the two major powers. Uh, Gregory, a 6.5 magnitude earthquake hit Taiwan last uh, Tuesday. Up to 17 were killed and 9 from mainland. So, why do you think Taiwan rejected uh, our offer from the mainland to send a delegation and help with the rescue efforts there? Well, she has her own calculations. Uh, one is that uh, by rejecting uh, the support uh, volunteered on the mainland side, she would say, you know, we can handle the issue. Well, we don't need any extra support. But primarily is to tell the people in Taiwan that we are operating on our own basis. Therefore, she's looking down the two elections coming up. For example, the uh, end of the year for the major election, and two years now from now is the general election. So by doing everything she can, you know, to give the voters in Taiwan an impression that we need ourselves to stand up on our own foot. We don't need outside interference. So if mainland China is not friendly to us, let's stand up to the challenge. A final word for this arms sale. I think arms sale, as we know in Taiwan in the past decades, serves no purpose whatsoever. Because if for any reason the PLA decided to attack Taiwan, those weapons are useless. So therefore, it's more a psychological consultation to Taiwan to purchase sort of protection fees. I'd like to see these funds in Taiwan not be spent for bomb sales, but for other constructive purposes. But the issue is whether uh, taxpayers of the power base of the DPP, the Green Camp, would be supportive of such uh, arms sales. Uh, now, when I was uh, talking about the release of worms from the camp, it uh, could also mean uh, head on collision, mm -hmm. For example, uh, in the domain of a, a diplomacy, quote unquote, between Taiwan and other small states, do you think uh, we have many tools in the box to encourage, for example, some of the small states in Central America and the Caribbean countries, whatever they are, to sever the official ties with Taiwan? And do you think this will be one of the options on the table to let Taiwan know the consequences? Yeah, uh, it's a really uh, uh, good question, and also it's a really significant, uh, significant uh, signal. Uh, Beijing, uh, on one hand, Beijing has a full capability to cut off every diplomatic ties uh, between uh, countries you mentioned and uh, Taiwan. But on the other hand, China will uh, will not do that till the hope of the peaceful unification is gone. So that will signal that if China determined to do that way you mentioned, that will mean the probability or danger of a military conflicts uh, is increasing. Therefore, breathing space diplomatically for Taiwan would be zero. That would be a very dim prospect for Taiwan to have any dignity in the international community. Hope Tsai Ing-wen, ahead of the Spring Festival, would give a second thought to the current defiance about uh, people to people exchange, including the cross street direct flights. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.